the other one that we're going to cover is Gnosticism. And uh, Dr. Hatchett, do you want to explain that heresy? Yeah, I'll take a turn. I don't know if you plan it this way, Carla, but just think of the ones that we're addressing. Um, they really emphasize how very tangible and earthy and world affirming Christianity is. Mm -hmm. In other words, when we come, come to the place of Christ, there were just some Christians who just said, oh, I just can't imagine him really being fully human. Or uh, others uh, earlier, like the dose of this, they said, no, he could only appear human. He, he, you know, God couldn't be uh, kind of linked or somehow incarnated like we think. Uh, again, there's this kind of uh, irony. Most people today think of Christians are, you know, as uh, just the they deny life and they deny fun. You know, the old joke is, you know, if, if it's if it seems fun, a Christian is against it. Right. You know, just, they, anything, everything, they just seem to deny uh, life. But in, in the ancient world, you see it more clearly. The, the reality is the Christians are the ones who are really saying yes to life and yes to creation and yes to the destiny that God still has of her creation and that he's not uh, surrendered that. In fact, he's given generously to redeem it with these gnostics again you have this a uh, 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 kind of movement we we don't really know the history and the origin or sources of gnosticism we we use that title though to to uh, describe a number of groups and movements in the book i paraphrase uh, a, a, i think a wise old approach to this from years ago in a book called early christian doctrine there this old oxford don said let's don't fight anymore about it, where narcissism comes from and speculate let's just give you a profile of these big second century gnostic t uh, systems and teachers that we have good documentation for so he drew together five sort of characteristics i don't know if i need to run through all five or whatever but you'll you'll find them in the book um and uh the big thing uh, around narcissism is maybe that second item in the list is that they see an absolute opposition like Ben mentioned, uh, but they don't just have a tension. This, this is like this division on steroids. They think that by its nature, something that is mental or spiritual, non-physical is pure. And that by its very nature, the tangible physical material world is inherently evil. Uh, it, it, even if it's seen for what it is, it's ugly. And so when you have this dramatic kind of contrast, the Christian story just doesn't work anymore. Uh, they're not comfortable with Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created, right? They're certain that it, whatever the uh, supreme reality of the world, and they call it a variety of things, some call it God, that that, that thing could never create the physical world. And uh, there were these lesser spiritual beings uh, that vary in potency and purity. And it was one of these lower knockoff gods or spiritual beings that out of either meanness or, or just negligence made the world. There would be no good reason to create the physical world. It is unredeemable, irredeemable. You ju it just cannot be repaired. So um, you can kind of map out the rest of it then in terms of who we are. Well, there's actually probably several categories for some of these Gnostics about what kind of people there are. But for the most promising, uh, we have a spiritual element in us, but we're trapped behind enemy lines. We're in this evil world within this evil body. And so learning the proper teaching teaches us to look beyond the facade of the physical world and, and to take it as real and serious or valuable in any sense. And it trains us to gain a liberty of our mental or spiritual self. And salvation then becomes leaving the building, right? I mean, you got to exit this place where you don't belong. Uh, and you, there's a spiritual journey, perhaps, towards a purity. But the first, uh, the first uh, crucial element of that is you have to abandon the evil world. Now, this shows up everywhere. It shows up in current kind of conversations about uh, who Jesus is, 
from serious ones to kind of not so serious ones like the Da Vinci Code. It's serious because it's popular. It's not serious because of its X's nose. But uh, it, it shows up in, in that kind of conversation. It shows up in ancient church. And sadly, some critics say we have a Gnostic light version of Christianity sometimes. And uh, even in my own tradition of conversionism, I'm a Baptist. I believe in that Billy Graham kind of conversion. I think people get saved. I, I do want to stipulate. I don't think everybody's getting saved looks the same. Uh, but I, I'm a conversionist. I'm completely all in. But, you know, I, I can hear some Christian brothers talk about, you know, it's as if though God is reaching down and, and plucking somebody out of this world that is going to hell in a handbasket without any promise. It's as if though God has no future for the world. You would also imagine that these people would have little place for the resurrection of the body. Mm, yeah. But if you just remember the resurrection is kind of the, the centerpiece uh, of uh, what Paul talks about in, when he culminating his reflection on Jesus's life. Uh, redeeming all of creation is crucial. And uh, so God wants all of you. There's not a disposable part of you. It's not like the Gnostics say uh, your psyche, your mental peer, you know, your, your perspective and, and, and outlook, whatever there is of you, uh, God redeems and all of his creation is important. And this, this approach uh, just argues that God would never really invest in the tangible world. Uh, it's a vexing idea, and it's surprising how persistent this idea comes and encroaches on Christian practice and sometimes deceives us. Can I, can I give one just a quick summary of this? Uh, the Bible Project has a, a video on heaven and earth, and, and they make the claim that the, the story of the Bible uh, is the union of heaven and earth, right? It, it's the very thing that the Gnostics want to keep to, uh, apart from one another. And, and so much I, I describe in a, in a short way, describe what we're trying to do in engaging theology is the Bible Project meets theology. Uh, they're telling the one common narrative of the Bible, and we uh, come and, and we work from that common narrative, but also show how theology, so your view of Jesus, your view of the Spirit, this work, your view of humanity, eschatology, how things turn out in the end, all fit within that biblical narrative. And so that uh, engaging theology then is the Bible project meets uh, systematic theology. Oh, I'll, awesome. I'll, I'll put a plug in, too, if I can. Uh, and and uh, uh, brag a little bit uh, as well. And that is one of the things I find uh, constructive about our project is we're not just selecting a text or two. Uh, ben does a, a beautiful job. That's primarily him. I confuse it and complicate it sometimes when I, but Ben does a beautiful job in showing how that doctrine fits with the entire arc of the whole big biblical story. And when you see that whole big biblical story, it, it forces you to be reminded that any kind of Gnostic scheme can't work because we're heading toward a destiny where God brings to fruition and completion his purpose in creation. He doesn't discard creation. He redeems creation. And, and uh, uh, anyway, I, I want to give my... Uh, uh, co-author there, I think, uh, props on something that's really very valuable in our in our book. Mm 